Welcome back. In this part of our lecture, I'll introduce the basics of common size financial statements, and then we'll begin to discuss three categories of ratios, liquidity ratios, solvency ratios, and efficiency or turnover ratios. I'll also use several real world examples to get my points across. So why would we want to evaluate financial statements of a firm? Financial statements provide benefits to everyone who analyzes them. If we're a manager of the firm, ratios calculated using the financial statements will help us compare our current performance to past performance or to the performance of our direct competitors. If we're an outside investor or the supplier of a firm, determining whether we want to buy shares or engage in a business relationship with that firm, ratios calculated using financial statements allow us to determine whether this firm is solvent and going to be able to pay its bills in the future. If we're a customer purchasing an expensive product from the firm, we might want to make sure that this firm is not going to go bankrupt and default on its obligations to us post-sale. All right, let's use some real-world data. So I've pulled together data from both Google and Apple. These are their balance sheets for fiscal year 2013. If I asked you which firm would perform better in an economic downturn, what would you say? Well, hopefully, you might say something along the lines of, there's not enough information to make a determination here. And if you did say that, I'd probably say you're correct. Now, the way we would like to ideally analyze those financial statements, so the balance sheet of Google versus the, val the balance sheet of Apple, is by using what are called common size financial statements. And common size financial statements scale all line items on each of the statements based on the largest line item. So common size balance sheets divide all line items by total assets, while common size income statements divide all line items by total sales. Now, by standardizing these financial statements, we can do really two things. First, we can compare the financial information of one company year over year. So we can look at the percent of total assets represented by cash in fiscal year 2010, 2011, 2012, etc. Second, we can also compare the percent of cash that Google has on its balance sheet to the percent of cash relative to total assets that Apple has. And we can use that information to make some sort of determination. All right. Now, the example I'm going to use throughout the rest of this part of my lecture is Macy's. So I pulled data directly from Macy's balance sheet here and then their income statement later on. So let's look at Macy's, uh, which for those of you who don't know is a retail company in the United States. Uh, so I've provided information for both fiscal year 2015 and fiscal year 2016. Now, how do we compare Macy's balance sheet from one year to another? Well, the way we do this is by computing the common size balance sheet. So what we're going to do is we're going to scale all of the line items on Macy's balance sheet by total assets. So we're dividing cash on the 2015 balance sheet by total assets. Same thing with the 2016 balance sheet. And the benefit here is that now we can get a sense of which accounts have diminished relative to total assets and which line items have actually grown. For example, we can see that the firm's cash and short-term investments shrank as a percentage of total assets. This is a potential concern to us if we believe that there's going to be a market downturn in the future. We can also see that total inventory rose from 2015 to 2016. This could indicate that the firm is not selling inventory on its shelves as quickly as it was in 2015. If we look at Macy's income statement, we can again only get a vague sense of how the firm is performing without some context provided by ratios or common size financial statements. We know the firm is profitable since it had net income of $1.072 billion in the year leading up to 1-30-2016. To get a better sense of how this firm is performing, let's create a common size income statement. Now, I've divided every line item on the income statement by total revenue we can get a sense of exactly how much of each dollar of revenue is getting eaten up by expenses and what percent of every dollar becomes net income. We can see that the net income is 3.96%. This means that for every dollar of revenue, Macy's earned 3.96 cents in profit. 
we can compare this to other competitors like Kohl's or JCPenney to determine whether this is good or bad. This leads us to our discussion of financial ratios. Ratios in finance take numbers from a firm's financial statements and other sources and allow us to examine some aspects of the firm's operations uh, relative to some benchmark. Ratios, on their own, are frequently hard to categorize as either good or bad. They need to be compared to something, say last year industry averages or uh, the ratio of a uh, major competitor. Most of the ratios we have give a sense of past performance and are not ideal for predicting future performance, but there are some ratios that use market data, such as the P-E ratio or the market to book ratio, that are believed to have some predictive ability. All right, so I'm going to talk about six different categories of ratios in this section and the next section. Uh, so liquidity ratios are typically ratios that tell us how liquid the firm's assets are. Solvency ratios or long-term solvency ratios tell us how likely it is that a firm is going to be able to make its interest payments to its creditors. Asset management or turnover ratios typically tell us how efficient the firm is. Profitability ratios tell us, obviously, how profitable the firm is. Market value ratios, or as they're sometimes known, valuation ratios, tell us how valuable this company is relative to its direct competitors. And then finally, payout ratios tell us how much of the firm's net income is being paid out to its shareholders. Let's start our analysis with the popular liquidity ratios. All right, so we have three of them. The first is the current ratio. It's current assets divided by current liabilities. It tells us, in essence, the firm's ability to pay off its short-term liabilities immediately. Typically, we say a current ratio above one is a good thing. The reason we say this is because if the firm needs to immediately pay off all of its immediate concerns, all of its current liabilities, it can. The quick ratio, or as it's sometimes known, the acid test ratio, is simply our current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. Now, the reason we have the quick ratio in addition to the current ratio is because many firms don't like to include inventory in liquidity ratios because that inventory might be hard to sell off without a large discount. In other words, what we're doing here with the quick ratio is removing the least liquid of the current assets from our calculation. So for example, let's say Ford is trying to calculate its liquidity ratios. Well, if Ford has a large inventory of vehicles, it may not want to include those vehicles in a liquidity ratio because it might be hard to sell those vehicles for exactly what they might be worth on the open market very quickly. Finally, we have the cash ratio. And the cash ratio is as simple as cash divided by current liabilities. It's not as popular as the first two, uh, but occasionally you'll see this used when you go to Google Finance or say Yahoo Finance or using Bloomberg. All right, let's take a look at the balance sheet of Macy's and then calculate the firm's liquidity ratios. So we have their balance sheet and we also know the current ratio formula. So the way we would calculate our current ratio is simply taking the firm's current assets divided by its current liabilities. So in this case, we're dividing 7652 divided by uh, 5728 and we get a current ratio of 1.34. What this tells us is that if Macy's needed to pay off all of its accounts payable, accrued expenses, the current portion of its long-term debt, it absolutely could do that, as long as that current ratio is greater than one. This tells us that Macy's is somewhat liquid. If we look at their quick ratio, we can see that once we take current assets minus inventory and divide that quantity by the current liabilities, their quick ratio is 0.375. Now, the issue here is that we don't have a hard and fast measure to tell us whether that's a good number or a bad number. As with all ratios, we need some context, which means we need to compare the quick ratio to the quick ratio of the firm last year or to the quick ratio of Kohl's or JCPenney. Finally, we can calculate the cash ratio. And the cash ratio is just the cash line item divided by current liabilities or 1,109 divided by 5728, and we get a cash ratio of 
The ideal liquidity ratios will depend on the industry in which the firm operates. Also, while a firm should be able to pay off its short-term liabilities, having liquidity ratios that are too high is not a good thing either. If a firm has liquidity ratios that are too high, this could indicate management has no good investment opportunities, which is a big concern to investors. The next category of ratios we have are financial solvency ratios. This group of ratios measures two different aspects of leverage, the level of indebtedness and the ability of a firm to service its debt. Now, we have three very common solvency ratios. The first is the debt to equity ratio, which is just total liabilities divided by total equity on the balance sheet. Now, first thing to note here, even though it says debt to equity ratio, the reason we use total liabilities is because of the asset total assets equals total liabilities plus total stockholders equity ratio uh, formula. The next ratio we have is the total debt ratio, and that's just total assets minus total equity, aka total liabilities, divided by total assets. And obviously this thing means more or less the same thing as the debt to equity ratio. Our denominator is different, but other than that, it's the exact same. Finally, we have the equity multiplier. And the equity multiplier, again, says more or less the same thing. It's just a different combination of those three definitional terms. So total assets divided by total equity. Now the reason we use the equity multiplier, even though we already have the debt to equity ratio and the total debt ratio, is because sometimes it's used in what's called the DuPont equation, which is a way that we can decompose firm's ROE, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. All right. Now, Let's use Macy's balance sheet to calculate a couple of these ratios. First, we have the total debt ratio. And like I said, that's just going to be our total assets minus total equity, aka total liabilities, divided by total assets. So here we have our total assets of 20,576 minus our total equity of 4,250. And that quantity divided by, again, total assets, 20,576 and we get a total debt ratio of 0.793. Our debt to equity, if you'll recall from a few seconds ago, we use total liabilities instead of total debt in this equation. So we take total liabilities of 16,326 divided by 4,250. Uh, keep in mind, I believe these are in millions. So our debt to equity ratio of 3.841 tells us that this firm, Macy's, is fairly highly levered. Finally, we have the equity multiplier. And the equity multiplier is just total assets divided by total equity. Uh, we can calculate that directly, or we could just add one to our total debt divided by a total equity measure. So either way, we're going to get 4.3841. All right. What do financial leverage ratios, or solvency ratios as they're sometimes known, tell us? Well, these ratios provide some indication about whether a firm can meet its obligations to its bondholders. Banks and firms in other industries with very stable cash flows will typically have higher debt to equity ratios. Uh, for example, most commercial banks will have a debt to equity ratio well above 8 or 9 or 10, indicating that for every dollar of equity, the firm has $8 of debt on its balance sheet. Other industries, like the tech industry, will typically have lower debt-to-equity ratios since the cash flow for these firms can be much more volatile. A debt-to-equity ratio greater than one would typically be considered very high for the tech industry. So what do financial leverage ratios tell us? They tell us something about, first, the ability of the firm to service its debt, and a lot of times, as a secondary indicator, it tells us how volatile the firm's cash flows are. If they're very volatile, the firm's management is going to be far less likely to fund new operations using debt, which means that the debt to equity ratio will typically be lower for firms whose cash flows are much more volatile. The next set of ratios we have are turnover ratios. And turnover ratios tell us how quickly a firm is able to turn over its inventory and convert its actions into cash. There's a huge number of turnover or efficiency ratios, uh, so not all of them are going to be listed here. We have turnover ratios that indicate how quickly a firm is paying its suppliers, how quickly the firm is going to sell its inventory off of its shelves, and we also have ratios that tell us how quickly the firm is receiving payment from customers. All right, let's use 
Macy's again to look at uh, some of these ratios. All right, so we have both Macy's balance sheet and income statement. The firm's inventory turnover, or cost of goods sold divided by inventory on the balance sheet, is 2.996 times. It's just going to be cost of goods sold off of the firm's income statement. So here, in this case, that is referred to as cost of revenue total. And we're going to divide that by inventory. And inventory is always going to come off the balance sheet. So that's how we get our inventory turnover numbers. All right. Now, inventory turnover can be computed using either ending inventory on the balance sheet or an average inventory number over the course of the quarter or the year. This is something that is a bit difficult for a lot of people who are first learning about ratios. Uh, there are a couple of different ways to calculate the inventory turnover ratio. Some analysts will sometimes just use the number on the, the firm's balance sheet. Other analysts will actually take the number on the balance sheet at the end of the year and then use the number for inventory in the previous year and take the average of those two numbers to get essentially a, a sense of the average total inventory over the course of the year. Most analysts that you talk to will recommend the latter approach, so taking it, total inventory of the end of the year and total inventory over the previous year, taking the average of those two, and that'll give you your, your average inventory that you can use to calculate inventory turnover. Next, we have days sales and inventory, which essentially says the same thing as inventory turnover. We just divide our inventory turnover number into 365. The result, 121.83 days, tells us how long, on average, it takes Macy's to sell all of the inventory on its shelves. As I mentioned, we also have a variety of other turnover, or asset utilization ratios. Let's talk about the receivables turnover. Receivables turnover tells us how many times a firm turns over its accounts receivable in a given year, while day sales in receivables, the other ratio that I have here, tells us the average collection period for accounts receivables. To calculate receivables turnover, we divide total revenue by accounts receivable, and that's going to give us our 48.529 measure. Now, that essentially tells us that Macy's is turning over all of its receivables, that its customers owe it, 48.5 times a year. It's easier to understand this measure when we divide that number into 365. So we're dividing to get our day sales and receivables. So we're dividing 365 by 48.5, and that gives us a day's sales and receivables of 7.521 days. That number tells us that it takes us, on average, 7.521 days before all of our receivables turn over, on average. Payables turnover provides a similar measure of how fast the company pays its bills. In this case, a higher number, within limits, is better. The goal is to collect money as fast as possible while paying bills as late as feasible. We calculate payables turnover as the cost of goods sold divided by accounts payable. In this case, Macy's payable turnover is 7.050 times a year. The day's cost in payable is 365 divided by the payables turnover, or 365 divided by 7.05. This gives us 51.773 days. Depending on the firm and the industry in which it operates, this could be very good or very bad for a supplier. We'd really want to compare these numbers, like all ratios, to those of Macy's competitors or the historical value for the ratio. All right, so what did we just cover? Well, we covered common size financial statements and why they're important. We also talked about liquidity ratios and whether or not higher numbers are better. In a lot of cases, yes, they are, but very high liquidity ratios can actually be a bad thing. We also talked about solvency ratios and how to calculate them. And finally, we talked about some of the most basic turnover or asset utilization ratios that we have in finance.